right, everyone. Good morning. Okay, let's try that again. Everybody together. Good morning. That just sends chills up my spine. That is wonderful. Thank you for being here today. We're glad you're here. I'm excited. Uh, as I uh, was in contact with another pastor friend of mine this morning, uh, this is what I said to him. I'm praying today that the wind and the breeze of the Holy Spirit would ignite the fan, uh, fan the flames in all of us today as we come together to do something very special uh, today as UBC and GJCC do our joint uh, service together. You know, a few weeks ago, we did separate services. Uh, we called that, uh, Pastor Nathan and I called that the pastor switch. <laughs> And it was a rainy morning, too, so, you know, the, uh, it was a, a little bit different. And we both enjoyed our time at the, at the two churches, and now we get to do it together. And there's nothing better than doing things together. It's out throughout the whole Bible. If you're not familiar today, University Baptist Church is offering ages zero to four years uh, that they will be watching for us today. If you have other children, we have two ways you can do that. We do have uh, stuff around that you can get them to color. We also have a little what we call a play area in the back of the sanctuary over here on this side. It's kind of partitioned off so the children can kind of run around if they need to, uh, and, but yet you can still keep an eye on them and, and still have a, a, you know, a, a wonderful worship service uh, for yourself because I know sometimes holding on to them can be difficult. So uh, that's uh, what it is. Uh, the next announcement I need to make, uh, my wife has insisted that I mention this, if you need to go to the bathroom, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> I've tried to be obedient. So if you go down this, in this hallway, go straight down, it's kind of crisscross, watch out, there's one step up and one step down. And as you go through the, the uh, cafe area uh, that we were using this morning, go out that door into the main lobby, turn right, you'll see water fountains, and that's where the bathrooms are, okay? Don't worry about it, you can get up and go anytime you want, and uh, just, uh, th that's where they are. So again, I want to welcome everybody for being here today, and I'm just excited about us doing what we call a joint service. We're also going to be doing the Lord's Supper today, and uh, you know, uh, Pastor Nathan will be giving the message, and I will be doing the uh, Lord's Supper part. So we're again working together uh, to uh, to worship the Lord, and I'm looking forward to both of those parts. I'm looking forward to hearing the message. And I'm looking forward to sharing and doing communion with you. It's a very special time. I know you all normally do it once a quarter. Uh, we do it the first of every month uh, over here at uh, Grace Journey. But, uh, but it's always a wonderful time. Uh, tithes and offerings, I want to just mention real quick. Don't want to say a whole lot about it. We put our tithes and offerings at GJCC in these communication and tithe boxes on both in the back door and the side door here. You can drop them in there. Also, there's blue cards if you want to leave any information. Any prayer requests, you can drop those, and those cards are up there. It should be some in the back seats, too, on some of the places, although we added a few seats for this uh, service today. But uh, anyway, you can drop those in the box also for us. And then also for uh, U UBC, we're going to have two guys, two of your folks at each door with an offering plate so you can drop in your offering there as you normally would do. All right, I think I've covered everything uh, that I have to cover. The last thing I'm going to mention real quick is Christmas shoe boxes. We're, we're here. This is really more for uh, GJCC, but... Yeah, we have our shoe boxes there. You can take those information. Uh, we're doing that, uh, all, you know, at this time uh, through November 19th. So if you can get those taken and get them back to us, uh, filled and the information cards as to what goes in there, it's a good cause. We go through a local company called On Missions, and they're based in Orlando. So we try and do that. It's kind of like the other shoe box company that does shoe box nationally. Uh, this one's locally, and most of theirs goes to Hi Haiti. Uh, those shoe boxes and as I always mention to everybody that the shoe boxes uh, for these children is not only what you put in it that's so important but it's also the plastic box that means a lot to them for them to keep uh, things that they have dry and secure and, and a lot of times they don't live like we do some of them are living on sand floors so a plastic box means a lot to them so they get a double thing you know you get presents you get hygiene things and you get a box that you can continue to use. It's very helpful. So don't forget about that. 
Uh, I want to call uh, Pastor Gene up. Pastor Gene today is going to do our scripture reading and uh, in our prayer as we continue in our service. Thank you, sir. Christy, thanks. It is great. Big on the back. So I get to read from Psalm 108, 1 through 8, I think is my scripture. And it says, My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. Do I have to hold this? Or can I pray without? You can pray without. All right, so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to get together. We thank you to, for the plan that you set in place at this point over four years ago. We pray that you'll continue to lay your hand of blessing and direction upon all of us. Give us wisdom. I pray that you'll lay your hand on each and every person that's here today. And if they don't know you as their Lord and Savior, that you'll quicken their heart and mind so that they might be able to understand the message and come to know you with your saving grace. <clears throat> I pray that you'll give each and every one of us an opportunity as we step out of these doors to be able to share that love and grace with somebody that we come in contact with this week so that they might also come to know you and understand that your gift of salvation is free, but it's everlasting. It's simple, but yet it's complex on what it does in our lives. I also pray that you'll lay your hand on the nation of Israel and continue to protect it, give them strength and wisdom, and let them overtake the enemy that is continuing to bombard them. It is in the name of your Son that we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Got a little bit different praise team than what you're probably used to, so I'll uh, tell you who we are. My name's Mark. I lead the music at uh, Grace Journey. Uh, we've got Joey over here who leads the music at University Baptist English, and Jacob who leads the music at University Baptist Spanish. And we're honored to be up here this morning to lead the worship and song of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we ask that you stand and join us. <clears throat>
continue worship our, our next song is going to be a bilingual song um, it's a song we all know it's blessed assurance but uh, I ask you guys to join us for both the English and Spanish and let's sing together as we worship the Lord song is going to be uh, Behold Our God, um, and I wanted to read uh, Isaiah 40, 12 through 13. Um, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens with a span, and closed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in the scales, er, in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord, or what man shows him counsel? Uh, and I really like the song. Uh, in, in, in the verses, it's kind of saying, uh, who has done these things? God, Christ, er, our Lord has done these things. Uh, and uh, in verse 3, it's the loving act of our Savior dying for us and then rising again uh, and saving us. Um, and uh, the chorus is saying, behold our God, come let us adore him. And I think it speaks to not just uh, the time uh, when we uh, eventually get to heaven and uh, worship Him for eternity, um, but every day on earth that we can we can behold our God uh, and that we can uh, give Him the praise that He is uh, deserving of, uh, because He has done these things and uh, He is uh, our salvation uh, and the Lord of our lives. Uh, and there's also a, sorry, uh, I meant to mention this, the bridge uh, has a male-female part. Um, we don't have females on the stage, um, but uh, Mark is uh, leading the women's part, uh, this very feminine voice. Uh, 
So in the bridge, uh, whenever he's singing the echo, uh, if the ladies would like to follow that, uh, and then I'll, I'll lead the man. Um, but yeah.
be seated. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, that song brought tear to my eyes. Uh, the Lord is real and he is here. He is here amongst us. And that's because, remember, the church is not the building. The church is each and every one of us here today. I want to invite Pastor Nathan to come up, and he's going to share a word with us. And I'm looking forward to hearing the word from Nathan today, and I hope you are as excited as I am. Pastor Nathan, come on up. Thank you, Pastor Bill. Church, this is phenomenal. This is great. Someone said, Pastor Nathan, you got to tuck your shirt tail in. I said, I'm too excited. I can't do it. I can't get that far. You know, this has been months in the making. Arguably, Pastor Gene, as you said early, it's been years in the making. And we have some guests that are here for the first time that maybe don't have a clue with what is going on. And I'll try to paint a general picture and try to capture at least a little bit of all that God's doing. Because Pastor Bill, as you just prayed and said, God is clearly on the move. Worship team, thank you so much for taking that role seriously to lead by serving the way Jesus did. Thank you so much for your preparation and coming together. What was represented here today was three church campuses leading in worship. And we appreciate that. Two languages. There'll be a little bit more Spanish coming out later as well. So I want to thank the team. I want to thank both churches, UBC, for coming to another location on a Sunday morning. That makes a pastor and anyone nervous to shut a facility down, because what if a guest comes? What if the regular attenders don't remember? Now praise God, November 5th, God gave us an extra hour. The Wilder family loves that extra hour, but we forgot, much like your family as well, the little babies are still on the old schedule. So Chase's 8 o'clock really was 7 o'clock a.m., but so good to be here. And then GJCC, Grace Journey Community Church, opening up the idea and the possibility not just to worship together, but something maybe much more than that, that will impact not only us here in the next few years, but generations to come. And that sounds preachy. But that is the reality of what we believe God is orchestrating and God is doing, and we're in the middle of that, so I can't help but be so excited to be in the middle of the move of God and you as well, that we, as a community of people in these local churches, that God would consider in all of His grace, raise your hand if you deserve to be here today. That's kind of a trick question. You're right. Those of you who raise your hands, in Christ we deserve to be here today. But outside of that, it is God's grace and His unconditional love on our lives that we would be here today included in the possibility of being a part of something that He is orchestrating. And so we've been studying God's move. When He moves, what is our responsibility before the move, in preparation, in the middle of the move, and then our responsibility following the move of God. So we're not just talking about putting together a church service. We're not just talking about putting together programs that's good for the kids, although that's good. We're talking about something larger than that. We're talking about the move of God that involves the stewardship and leadership of gathering together in church, of putting the programs together. But the ultimate picture, the ultimate goal is, God, are you allowing us to find more ways to maximize and bring you glory? to maximize our leadership, to maximize our stewardship, to maximize that, God, to bring you more glory than we can apart from one another. And so we've been praying for God's confirmations in this faith journey that publicly has been months, really since this past summer. And we've been praying not just corporately as a couple of churches, but personally we've been challenged all of us to pray that we would see the move of God. God, help us to put on your glasses. Help us to put on your, uh, help us to have faith eyes to notice your move, to see your move, to record and journal when you move. And personally I pray that you've seen God at work. 
corporately as a church, each of us individually, that we've seen God work and could together today be another example of God at work. We've seen it, Pastor Bill and others, in the private meetings, in the meetings outside of this place. We've seen God at work. How about your places of work? How about your places of occupation? Have you noticed God in a unique way in your situation where God has you that He is clearly at work? I need to be careful here because I want to express and be transparent with just a glimpse, a little bit, of where I have seen personally God at work. I could, there's, there's pages of notes that I'm journaling because I never want to forget God's faithfulness. And I want to look back at these moments that we're experiencing in 2023. And remember, at the next hard time, at the next faith step, that I'll look back at these moments and clearly see God's provision and His faithfulness, and that will encourage me, it'll encourage us to keep going forward in His move. Specifically, we've studied Abraham. And know at the end of his story, God was ultra-specific, very specific, when his move of the birth of Isaac was right around the corner. Within a year, Abraham was waiting decades, and then the move of God was just within a year. God got very specific, and we've been praying, God, would you get that specific with us as well? For me personally and for the Wilder family, early in 2023, before we knew anything of what God was doing, God began to do a work inside of me. We've learned in our case studies in Scripture that before God moves, God will recruit a leader. God will call a leader to lead in that move. He will then call leadership to lead in that move, and then He'll call all that are in that move centered on the Lord to participate in that move. Early 2023, God began to challenge me and encourage me that He says, in this bivocational model, which is where pastors have another job and we pastor, all right? Um, he said, you're putting in a lot of hours there, but I'm going to give you more capacity to handle more. And I say, God, there's no more hours to give, but I'm excited about that. In the last eight years, if I had a personal case study of bivocation and the way that we've done church through COVID and beyond, I say, God, I'm not going to doubt you. I know somehow, in some way, although the hours are out in the day, you're going to somehow increase capacity. And for me, he said, I'm going to increase capacity in the business world. I'm going to increase capacity in the church world. And so my family and I are excited and we're saying, God, what does that mean for the future and the next season of our life? And then he began to reveal the church part of that, beginning in the summer of 2023, that we believed that God was preparing me before I knew, God preparing Bill as he stood in the gap this past year and a half, and us as churches, that he had some God-sized plans and orchestration that he was putting together that Hollywood couldn't touch that he was paving the way, that he was working beyond what we saw, and then he started to give us glimpses through conversations and meetings of his move, and here we are today, and we're about a month out from what we believe would be the date of the official vote, where each of our churches would vote according to God's will. Prayerfully, if any of this is true, and I don't believe we serve a God who plays tricks, in other words, that He would personally or corporately take us down a road and say, just kidding. We serve a God who is of order. We serve a God who is intentional. And we believe that He's taken us down this road that would lead towards a vote that would confirm what He's planned on doing years before, and there may be some greater things even ahead. Would we remember this day and many more a year from now to look back and say, God, to you be the glory. That's the only thing we can say. We can't point to our churches. We can't point to our people necessarily. We can't to point towards our budgets. We can't point towards fill in the blank. But God, the only thing left is to point towards you. You're the one that did this. You get the glory. You get the credit. And so personally, I'm at a point in my life where I'm saying, God, I've seen you so clearly, and it's propelling me through this next season of God's calling. 
And I think as each church could testify over the last, this year specifically in 2023, but also dating back years before that, that UBC specifically, Pastor Bill, I, I think you guys felt this too, COVID. Can we pivot? Can we be flexible? Can we make it through? Will we survive? Can we then thrive? What is it going to look like during COVID and post-COVID? And each church called to open the doors, to not give up gathering together. We've learned the importance of that. And to continue to steward in God's move because he has great plans ahead. And for UBC, we say, God, but we've got buildings and we've got to figure out we need renovation. We'll need, Pastor Gene, we'll probably need a roof soon. We're going to need leadership to help us through this. We don't have any funds to go towards an extra renovation project that could be in the couple hundreds of thousands of dollars. What are we going to do? Pastor Bill, we said, maybe we try to look at building a building where you're looking at minimum $1 million, if not more. We can even touch that conversation. And so at UBC we concluded, just like in the New Testament, where the boy says, I've got, God, I'm a, I'm a disciples, I'm going to give you all I have. I've got two fish and five loaves of bread. And we said, our two fish and five loaves of bread is, let's maximize what we have. And let's trust it all to the Lord and see what He can do. Can we experience the provision of God, much like we read about in the Bible, much like we've heard about? Can we experience that in real time? And at UBC, all of us would say, amen, we've seen it, His provision. This is before all of this, Pastor Bill. And then here this conversation comes up. And we have GJCC that says, we are in need of vision. We are in need of leadership to enter into the next season that God has for us. And we're not going to shut our doors and we're not going to sell this off. God, we believe that what you've done for decades that you still plan to do and you're not finished yet. And so Pastor Bill and leadership team and church, Grace Journey, you haven't given up. And we come together and say we want to fan the flame of what God is doing. And if you need leadership, maybe God's calling us to lead. If we need for Facilities, maybe God's calling you to provide that. And could it be that University Baptist Church now is one church in multiple locations and in multiple languages? Could that be? Now, if Pastor Bill didn't step up and if GJCC didn't step up and keep the doors open, we wouldn't be here today. UBC, if we gave up and gave in during COVID and beyond to go through those difficult years, we might not be here today. And so this is an illustration. It's a picture of what could be to come. This may be a glimpse of what could be that a year from now we do look back at this moment. Let's mark it. Put it on, the, on your calendar. Mark it. Circle it. Highlight it. Remember this corporately as churches, but also personally what God is up to. And I've got to be careful because now I think about what's going on where I work. At a place called Blue Logistics during the week. And God has allowed me to be a chapel, a chaplain, along with a leadership position in this organization. I've been able to lead prayer movements and have a chapel during lunch. This is in a public place. And I had a person that put a stop to that. And my supervisor, my boss said, Nathan, you've got to kind of take off the pastor hat a little bit for, for, for a while. And that was very discouraging. And honestly, I thought it would have happened years before that. We made it three years in a public space where we had chapel almost every Wednesday during lunch and a prayer movement. So I actually looked at, looked at that as a victory. But you know we said last week at UBC, I'm sure you've claimed that here, Pastor Bill, that my God is bigger than man's attempt to distract or man's attempt to stop. You know what happened this past week at Blue Logistics? I had in one of our warehouses, in one of our spaces, the, the, the staff was meeting around a lunch table and said, Nathan, they call me coach, they call me multiple things. Most are good, some are bad. Nathan, <laughs> come here, come here, come here. I said, yes, yes, yes. They said, would you pray for this person and that person? They're in surgery right now. Can we just pray around this table, right in the, in the middle of everything? And I was able to pray with that group in the name of Jesus. Not a general prayer, not a general God, but specifically 
the God of the Bible in the name of Jesus. And I said, God, you are bigger. We may not have had chapel, but we just had prayer. And then the other warehouse with a whole other staff said, Nathan, don't leave this place until you come find me. Usually that's some kind of logistical emergency, which happens throughout the day all the time. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And they said, we want to gather as a group. And we want you to pray over all the things that are happening because we're going through it. And one of these employees we've had major conflict with over a couple of years, and this is the very employee that God is softening the heart that asked me to come pray over. We gathered in the corner of the warehouse. They lit a candle. We gathered together. They had prayer requests. It felt like church. We prayed over the requests, and we said, we've got to do this more often. When I left that place and got in my car to drive back to another spot, I said, God, you are showing me that you are bigger again than man attempt to distract or to stop what's going on. And then something happened uh, this past a week or two ago that involves discipleship, it involves giving and helping out those in need, you know. Um, the Acts, early Acts, the early church uh, kind of stuff going on. And I was meeting with, with a couple, and, and there was a, another family in need, in need of a, a large amount of, of funds. And this couple came forward and said, um, here is some provision. And I said, okay, this is kind of getting silly now because this is huge for this family. And it was more than enough to provide for this family in the time of need that they have. And this donor said, this giver said, but you need to attach this verse with this gift. And this is within the last one to two weeks. And Pastor Bill sent me the scriptures that we're going to read here this morning. And one of the scriptures was the exact passage, the exact verse that was attached to this large donation to help this family in need. And I called this giver up and I said, um, or maybe it was a text, and I said, God's, like this is sort of getting silly now. This is so specific, and maybe God is confirming with you guys, maybe He's confirming with me, but this is now very specific things. And then the second verse that we're going, the second passage that we're going to read later was this included in this discipleship process. Literally, we were just talking about this exact passage and verse, and I'm saying, God, you're bigger, but yet you're so personal. You are so personal personal. My dad sent me a text this morning. He does every Sunday to my brother and I, and he gives us a spiritual challenge. And he said, he called the father, he said, my dad, we worship you today. Abba Father, very personal Father in the Bible. And so we're getting so specific, we're getting such clarity that it may be like Abraham that God is providing and showing up in such a real way that it moves from faith to obedience. That it's moving from a faith step, it's a scary faith step. What about the unknowns and all these things that we go through in all of our faith steps? But because God's encouraging and showing up with such specificity, I'm moving in my heart from scary to I either need to obey or disobey because God has already made it clear. And I'm wondering what's going on in your heart. We need to make sure that we don't let fear conquer our faith. We need to make sure that in all of these faith steps, which always, don't you love and hate this, always includes a scary element. It always includes a scary part. I love and hate that. I hate it because it's scary. Every time. Although God has shown up in our lives in the past, God, will you show up again? But I love it because it forces me to stay close to Him. It forces me to pursue Him. It forces me to remind myself that I'm in need of His provision. We must not let fear lead the way. Our faith must be greater than our fear at every faith step, or else we'll never take that step. Paul says to Timothy, you know this verse in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but what? But of power and love 
and self-control. And that is the prayer that I would say, God, would you lead me in that? And that is the prayer for us as we're at work, as we're at church, as we're in activities, as we're parenting, as we're married, as we're grandparenting, as we're partnering in ministry and all the things that we're in. God, would I allow my faith to lead the way and not let fear get the best of me. Our title this morning, Pastor Bill knows this, I'm wrestling with this as early as possible. And you know in a bivocational model it's hard to get sermon content, worship, you know, content. It's hard to get titles, it's hard to get passages early, like Monday or Tuesday, early in the week. It's always later in the week, all the way up until sometimes Sunday morning. And I wrestled with what could this title be to try to capture this moment and beyond. And so the title is not anything brilliant and it's not even long. It's this, the eternal impact of the unified church. The unified within the church, the unified kingdom church and the unified Christians around the world centered on the gospel and that of Jesus Christ. We're talking about the unity of the local, the unity of the kingdom church. And what I would like to say is this is not an icing on the cake conversation. That sometimes we treat it like that, but it is completely essential and eternity is at stake. Because Jesus prays in our main passage, if you want to scroll there, open there. John chapter 17, John chapter 17, Jesus prays that our unity would be a witness to the world, which means if we're not unified, how are we going to be the lighthouse that God calls us to be to strengthen and advance His kingdom? And so a lot is at stake as we gather here this morning together. Some context, this is just before the Garden of Gethsemane, which I love that moment of Jesus. Um, it's just before the arrest and the crucifixion and the resurrection. Jesus is in the upper room with his first and initial disciples in an intimate setting. He's with his best friends. He's with those he can trust. From the human perspective, one was in the room that he couldn't trust. An ordinance of the church that we've been practicing for 2,000 years, they share in the Lord's Supper. And like Pastor Bill said, we'll be sharing the Lord's Supper here in just a moment. But Jesus is teaching in this moment, before the garden, before the arrest, before the crucifixion, with the weight of the sins of the world on the shoulders of Christ, He's teaching all kinds of theology and all kinds of vision and all kinds of what's going to take place with Him and the future of His followers, the church. And in this prayer in John 17, it's beautiful. He prays for his original disciples, and then it reaches a point in the prayer where he prays for all future disciples. He prays for us. I want you to personalize this in this passage. Never doubt that others are praying for you. Raise your hand if you believe that there's someone else on planet Earth that has prayed for you at some point in your life. Do you believe that? It's probably every hand in the room. And do you know that there's people that you don't know that are praying for you? There's a great grandparent, there's a grandparent, there's a friend, there's a cousin, there's somebody that maybe you don't even know praying for you. And if someone says, I'm not sure if any anyone is praying for me, you can come back to John 17 and say, Jesus Christ Himself prayed for you, and I believe had you in mind 2,000 years ago when He teaches and challenges and encourages through this prayer, beginning in John chapter 17, verse 20, where Jesus says, I do not ask for these only, His initial disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. What if they didn't continue the torch? What if they didn't pass the baton? We wouldn't be here today. What I want you to do is insert your name right there. I do not ask for these only from the words of Jesus, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Jesus is praying for you. Put your name there. He's praying for me. I'm putting my name there. I've been prayed over and prayed for directly from the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. 
And he prays this, that they, his followers, may all be one. Just as we model, just as you, the Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. Why? Here's the witness part. Here's the testimony part. The testimony part. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one. As we are one, verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. Now that's impossible unless you're centered on the cross, unless you're centered on Christ. Your marriage won't make it. It's hard enough without Christ. But if you're not centered on Christ and each seeking Christ, then it won't make it. But my Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 that Christ's love never fails. But we've got to be unified in our marriages. We have to be unified in our families. We have to be unified in our congregations. As Kingdom Church, we must be unified. I was a uh, know of a church in the past where they were unified. The problem, they were completely unified. They were unified, but they were unified about the wrong thing. They were unified around the wrong thing. We must be unified around Jesus Christ. That we would be perfectly one so that, here's the testimony part again, here's the witness part again, the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. So Jesus prays two things, that the church would be unified and that our unity would be a witness for him. If a guest comes in and they come off of Highway 50 and they come to this place and they smell, they sense disunity, that's not a good witness for the Lord. Because with the Lord comes Unity. And if they sense and they can smell unity, then that's a great witness of the Lord as we are His light even inside these four walls and especially outside of these four walls. Here's the math equation that unity within the church. And we're putting that to the test, Pastor Bill, with GJCC and UBC and all the other acronyms and letters you want to put in there. We're putting that to the test that we would be unified as local churches individually. But if God is calling us to join, that we would remain unified in Christ. And if we can have that unity and then have unity within kingdom church, surrounding churches, then we will be the witness to the Lord and have a shot at being His light, where the world who's lost trust in the church could maybe trust again. So first, church unity is essential. The building block of the church is the family. Therefore, it's essential that the family is unified on Christ. And Pastor Bill, I love your notes here. I've got a couple of excerpts to cap, uh, catch up UBC on what you've been preaching the last couple of weeks. But here's a couple of excerpts from Pastor Bill's sermons the last couple of weeks in relation to unity. God wired us to do life together. He created us and called us to do life in community. The only way, Pastor Bill preached, to experience the life we are truly meant to live is to learn how to live in and amongst community, even when you don't like others. When you don't, you say, well, that's not my personality type. God has still built us for relationships with Him and with each other. He says, you were created by God and you are a masterpiece. And I love this. Pastor Bill encouraged GJCC to say, pray God that He will help you realize that you are a masterpiece. Sometimes we forget that. And then ask Him to help you see others. This is key. That you would see others as God sees you. That you would see others as God sees the others. And the good news, Pastor Bill said, that is that the world is drawn to that kind of love in action. We can say all we want. We can post on our website all we want. We can post on social media all you want. We can say we're unified. We love each other. That's great. Well, when we do ministry and when people walk through these doors and we try to partner and do ministry and invest in the community, what do they think? What do they sense? He says, on the contrary to this unity, Pastor Bill said, a divided church is a defeated church. UBC, I've shown you this illustration, Grace Journey, I haven't with you, but I want you to see the basketball on the screen. And some of you are all into NBA and some of you are all into basketball. Raise your hand if you're a basketball player, if you've ever made a basket in your life. Have you ever made a basket in your life? You've got this basketball here, and you've got for this basketball to fulfill its purpose to get through the hoop. 
It's got to be designed in such a way to balance. It's got to be designed in such a way to be able to pass. It's got to be able to rotate correctly and eventually get through that hoop to score a goal. That would be a thriving church. A thriving church where spiritual gifts are active, where you've got um, growth, you've got ministry, you've got servant leadership, you've got all the things that we see and we read and we're taught in the scriptures that we're able to not just survive as a church, but thrive and fulfill the purpose to be the lighthouse in the community so that we can see goals scored. But sadly, we've got a bunch of churches that are more like this. We've got a shredded basketball. We've got a deflated basketball. We've got fault lines. We've got gaps. We've got cracks. We've got disunity. And I would argue that this basketball is not as effective as the one on the screen. When I try to bounce it, it doesn't bounce. When I try to pass it, it doesn't pass. When I try to shoot it, it doesn't rotate correctly, and it's the same with the church. That the church, if we're not unified, and if we're not functioning as God designed us to function, meaning we're not applying our spiritual gift sets, we're not leading, we're not sacrificing, we're not giving, we're not partnering, all the things that we're not able, we're not able to fulfill what God has designed us to fulfill, which He calls His lighthouse. And so Pastor Bill said, we must make every effort to keep Unity. Where does he get that? He gets that from the scriptures. We must be devoted to Christ, the church, and the community. When we do, we may have the privilege of seeing the result of this unity that Jesus prayed for, a unity centered on Christ, where we can be a God-honoring witness of Christ himself. And as we move to our second part of this passage, and we'll conclude here shortly, discipleship one-on-one -on -one has to include the understanding and acceptance of the gospel. Someone says, no, 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 pastor, discipleship is growing deeper. Yes, it is, but how do you grow deeper unless you don't understand and operate through the lens of the gospel? of the Great Commission and sharing the gospel. A Christ-centered, unified church is equipped, and I would dare say loves and is obsessed with the Great Commission. And I want to go through a couple of passages here today. Get ready to flip the Bible like we used to, or scroll in your cell phones like we do in today's day and age. Because I found a Great Commission, which we know the go-to Great Commission, but there's a Great Commission before the Great Commission. I found another Great Commission before the Great Commission before the Great Commission, and I kept going and there's more, but let's look at about three today quickly. The Great Commission, the go-to passage, you know it, it's found at the end of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20, where Jesus comes to his disciples and he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, verse 19, go therefore and do what? Make disciples. How do you make disciples unless you share the gospel? The Great Commission, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, not some, not a particular group, but of everybody. The invitation is everybody. The inclusivity of Christ, but also the exclusivity of Christ is active, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We had five baptized a couple of weeks ago at UBC that wanted to show the church and the world what has gone on on the inside. They were ready to show the church and the world the expression of what Jesus has done inside their hearts. They're ready to show on the outside what is taking place on the inside. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Many times the church fails where we're so excited about the salvation and we're so excited about the baptisms, and then we drop the ball when it comes to discipleship. We cannot drop the ball. They go hand in hand, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Praise God that Jesus is with us when we're trying to answer his call. Let's look at the Great Commission before the Great Commission. Have you ever seen the Great Commission right in the middle and the, towards the beginning, actually, of the Sermon on the Mount? If you would flip to Matthew chapter 5, you see it here, beginning in verse 13. You know this passage. This is the Great Commission. Jesus says, you 
disciples, followers of Christ, both now and 2,000 years from now, gathered as UBC and GJCC. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under the people's feet. It's like the church that's acting like this. It's no good. It's not effective. Verse 14, Jesus says, You are the light of the world, though. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is great commission all over this passage. Let's go one more in the Old Testament. Pastor, there can't be the great commission in the Old Testament. It's only in the New Testament. Then you tell me. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, where God says through Isaiah, generally to the servant of the Lord, he says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you, listen, as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. It looks like, it sounds like, it reads like that verse should be in the New Testament. Praise God for His specific and special revelation in His Word where we see the Great Commission where God is calling His followers to be His light so that the kingdom of heaven that is open to all would be expanded in Christ. These are powerful words throughout the Scripture. Sad part is, Churches are not taking this seriously. I know of a church a little while ago when I learned this story, I couldn't sleep that night. I really felt like I couldn't sleep for days. You know, there's needs all around our community. We know that. There's smaller needs, and there's sadly some very big needs. All are needs. And there was a particular church that's located across the street from an elementary school. And sadly, this elementary school received a bomb threat. And so the parents, I'm sure, were notified, of course, the school. And when that happens, you must exit. And we're talking kindergarten through fifth grade. It's a big public school. It's right on a major road. There's a church across the street from this school. And what I saw, literally saw and observed, was that this elementary school walked across the street. They went by the church, all of them, in a line. Hundreds and hundreds of teachers and students walked right by the church, and they went to the next public property, which was the high school. There was a pretty big hike, especially for the little ones. But they had to do it. And what, women, what came across my mind was, was this church that's right across the street not on the radar of this school during a time of need? Was, it, was there possibly a partnership that was not there so that when there's a time of need, whether a family is hungry and they need food, or whether there's a bomb threat or something worse, that someone could not pick up a phone or send a text or run across the street and say, church, church, we need help now. But what happened in my heart and my mind is that it's very possible that even the locations in proximity, that the church and the school were very close, they were very distant to where the church was not on the radar. Therefore, the one that answered the phone and the text the fastest was the high school that was right down the road. Now, it may have been that they had to with certain protocol, but you know and I know that in times of emergency, protocol follows the emergency. You'll get to protocol, but you may not have time to get to the right protocol. There's a bomb threat, and we've got kids, and they're leaving right now. We've got to get to the closest, safest spot. And I couldn't sleep for a couple of days because I thought I never want to be a part of a church that's not on the radar of an extreme need like that. And then I started taking, uh, thinking personally, and I was convicted personally to think about how many friends do I have where Jesus is not on their radar, and I'm not on their radar, and the church is not on their radar, and when that person has their next need, will, which will come, they're not turning to Jesus. They're not calling me, and they're not calling the church. So what are they doing? They're calling the world, the only thing that they know. Um, my family and I, we were talking about this last night with our girls, and that we have a generation that's filled with unchurched parents now, and the next generation. Unchurched. 
In fact, you know the Orlando area, there was a church planner that told me that we are 12 to 14 percent churched. And some would believe that we're on the edge of the Bible Belt. There's churches everywhere. But legit people seeking the Lord through a local church, you're looking at a whopping 12 to 14 percent. That's a lot of people that are unchurched. And I was given that stat probably over 10 years ago. So it's probably worse than that now. There's a book called Good Faith that reveals the gap between the local church and its community. And this, church, this book says that Christians in today's culture are increasingly perceived is irrelevant and extremist. The 60% of U.S. adults view evangelism as extremist, like you're weird if you're sharing the gospel. Bible study is increasingly considered irrelevant, because what would this historical book have to do with me today? 75% of U.S. adults agree a person can live a pretty good life and a decent life without being a Christian. Christians are feeling tension as they try to engage with neighborhoods, communities, and governments. Yes, we're all feeling that, and we're all praying and studying how do we close that gap because this is troubling. We need unity amongst the local church and also unity among the kingdom church to be the light so we could be on the radar to the schools that are across our street, to the businesses that are adjacent and across our street, to the neighborhoods that are surrounding this place. The convicting question is, is Jesus on their radar? Do they have a Christian on their radar? Is a church on their radar? I'm talking about on their phone where they could text or dial up at a moment's notice at the next need. If not, we must team together to get on the radar. But the problem is we're so focused on ourselves we forget about everybody else. Now if we were talking about name change in this church, which we're not, at least right now, who knows what God does in the future, but we're not even talking about that. We're not complicating things. We're saying, listen, we're talking about gospel, growth, and go. Let's unite under that. University Baptist Church, let's do this. But if the name of the church was this one on the screen, we would have to change it immediately. We would never let this acronym slide because this is the ME Church. There's no way we could actually, it doesn't really stand for that, but when I put in ME Church on the internet, this popped up. The, the problem is we are acting like the church is about me, that it's about I, that's it about the attention is on me, not team, instead of we. How big can we get for our glory? What can we do out there so that we can get the attention on the internet or in the physical world? That's a problem. Because that's not going to get us on the radar to the community where the community at their next need says, I've got to turn to this Christian friend that I know, or the church down the, ro down the road that I know that they care, or ultimately to Jesus Christ himself. And someone says, well, kingdom church partnering, it's not practical, it's not possible. Churches don't work together. They're, we're all in our silos. And true, but that's not how it should be. And some of us in the room have been a part of a ministry called Mission Interact. And we've got data over 10 years of case study and 10 years of partnering and data that says it is practical and it can be possible at everyone if everyone centers on the Lord. Look at the screen right here. Like this is amazing. People would say that can't happen. There's some in the room that would testify with me that says, oh yeah, well it did happen. Mission Interact, in one week, which is a local mission camp overnight, in one week there were 30 plus churches partnering together to wash the feet of the community. 20 high schools, 15 plus middle schools, 80 plus service projects in one week. And we were not waving the banner of our unique churches, we were waving the banner of Jesus. And you cannot tell me that that did not have, that that did not have a kingdom impact. And so we have 10 years that we would say, I know it's hard and I know it doesn't seem like it's practicable or possible, but we've lived it for 10 years and it may not be going on right now, but this needs to be part of the spiritual growth process in the prayer. And so in conclusion, I want to say that God gave me this picture. 
And I've shared this with UBC, but this picture just sticks with me as I'm working in the community, as we're ministering in the community, as we're meeting others and doing the work of the Lord in the ministry. When we say, God, what would it take for America to return back to you? What would it take to East Orlando that's unchurched? What would it take for revival to wash over this community? What does it look like? And so God gave me a great picture as I have one of my kids at a water park. And these water parks are amazing and they're so fun. And you remember at the water park what's on top of a lot of these that I didn't know. And if you ever bring your little one or your grandparent, there's the bucket. If you don't know that's there, let me warn you now, because as people are gathered at a certain spot at the water park, they're waiting for water to rain down on them. And so I didn't realize this as I had my kids and going around and realized it quickly. But I think in the middle of the night, God gave me this vision years ago that said, I'm going to give you a picture of how this could look across every community and city across the country, if not the world. I want you to picture a bucket on top of every city, on top of every community, every town. And so picture a bucket at Union Park area. Picture a bucket at Bonneville area. And the bucket is pouring the pipe and the water is pouring into the bucket first, and at some point there's a tipping point. And so spiritually, I'm saying, God, what is, help me make sense of this. This is fun. This is great. But help me make sense of this. It's another time where I couldn't sleep at night where God was saying, as the local church would be the church, serve, invest, sacrifice, partner, unite, do the things of me, answer my call. As you're being the church, I'm pouring my love into that bucket. I'm pouring my spirit into that bucket. I'm pouring my grace in that bucket. And there's a tipping point. And at my discretion, in my timing, in my way, I'm going to tip that bucket and there's going to be revival on the land that my love is going to splash on everybody around. My love is going to splash on people that don't even want it. Those that are sunbathing around, they don't want to get hit by the water, but guess what? They're going to be splashed by the love of God that may be on the verge of changing their life and they don't even know it. But it doesn't happen. The bucket does not pour. We can pray for revival all we want to, but unless the church is actively being the church, uniting as a witness for the Lord, the bucket can't fill and it can't turn. Don't we think that the Bible, that God wants to tip that bucket of revival? And we believe, Pastor Bill, church, that God is doing a new thing. God is entering us into a new season. When we thought it was over, you've been at a point in your life, personally I have as well, where I do I throw in the towel because it feels like it's over? I don't feel like I have a purpose. I, feel like, I don't feel like I have the future. But in God's grace, He kept you going. In God's grace, He kept me going. In God's grace, He kept us going. And here we are today with all kinds of vision and all kinds of potential, and we find ourselves in the middle of a faith step. We don't have it all figured out. But what I'm crystal clear on is God is on the move, and in His grace, He's including us in that, and I can't help but be excited about that. I can't help but get even more excited about that. And so we're about to have the Lord's Supper. Here's the question, the convicting question that I have for myself and for us today, that will I, will we answer the call, the gigantic eternity on the line call to be unified, to be a unified witness for the Lord This starts in my marriage. It starts in our family, the building block, the family of the church. It extends out to the local church, each of us, and then us together and on to the kingdom church. Let's pray for our role in this whole thing that God is doing, personally and also corporately. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you for all the work you've done personally and corporately over the last months, years, and some would testify decades of your gospel seed being planted. And we find ourselves for such a time as this, we find ourselves in a season where we see you working in ways that we can't argue against. That yes, there's faith involved, and yes, there's the scary that comes with it, but God, as we see in your word that we're not going to let fear drive us. We're not going to let fear lead us, that we're going to be on board with you as our leader. We don't want to get in the way. We want to steward and follow what you are orchestrating, what you are putting together, and a result of that, God, would it impact 
impact those in this building and those outside this building for years to come and for generations to come? Could it be that the decisions that are made over the next month and what takes place over this next year and one to three years, God, is that wow factor that generations from now could look back and be inspired and encouraged that there was a group of people willing to take maybe some of the biggest faith steps of their life in order to answer the call of God. God, we trust all of that with you. We trust the results and outcomes to you. And we trust what you're doing in each and every single heart. I told my family this morning, whether it's Chase, who's three, or my oldest, who's 19, or the girls that are middle and high school in between, that this is God working on them as well, God, that personally you would do a work. You would reveal your faithfulness personally through this experience. And then as we come together centered on the Cross, God, that you would confirm and finish that work corporately, together as one. Jesus, we pray for the unity that only comes centered on you and the witness that could be a result. God, I pray that the community would get ready. God, that you would prepare the community that they're getting ready to be splashed with your love in a way that they need, that they desire. And God, you would get them ready for that, even now. Would you get us ready, even now? Now, thank you for today. We continue to give this time to you. And as we move into this intimate time of Lord's Supper, God, that your believers would testify that you are our Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for always being bigger. We pray in your name. We align and we follow you. Amen and amen. Pastor Bill. Boy, um, what do I say about that? When we began to sing uh, together, that bucket overcame me. Uh, we we at, at Grace Journey Community Church haven't had a crowd this large, well, in a long time. And uh, that's probably about 10, 12 years. And uh, that bucket moment was, was that time when we all started to sing, for me personally. Uh, so it's already begun. As I shared with Pastor Nathan this morning, um, that uh, another pastor friend of mine, we were, we were praying this morning uh, about what we were about to do today. And we talked about the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would be here today, and the Holy Spirit is. And it was here with Nathan as he preached today the, the Word. And I believe that the Holy Spirit has been working uh, with both of our churches for many, many months now. I mean, Nathan and I went from the first time that we talked on the phone uh, and then met in person. Uh, where we've come from then has is, is been nothing less than God at work. If you're not in my regular, the regular GJCC company, I, I just want to share this with you. I talk about Joseph a lot. Right, right guys? <laughs> And he's one of my favorite characters. Why is he one of my favorite characters? Well, it's because as he went through being threatened to be killed by his brothers, sold into slavery, accused of, falsely accused of trying to rape somebody, thrown into the dungeon, and then forgotten by the very cupbearer that was released, that he you know, told him what was going to happen, and he asked him not to forget him, and he promised he wouldn't forget him, and he did forget him. And yet, what did Joseph do? Throughout all those points in his life, he did the best he could, and he stayed faithful. That's why I love him so much. And then, of course, at the very end, hindsight's always 2020, and I believe we're going to be able to look back in not too much further in the future and, sit and look back and be able to say, this was all according to God's plan, which is exactly what he said to his brothers when they thought after Dad died, he's going to kill us. And what if Joseph said, what you meant for evil, God used for good. You did exactly what you were supposed to according to God's plan for him. God's plan for our churches. For our churches. Think about that. What he wants to do. That's what Nathan and I have been talking about for months. What does God want to do with our churches? What can be done if we would join forces together? Just like Joseph being faithful, I, I think it's wonderful. 
Let's get started with another wonderful thing, and that's doing communion together. It talks about communion together in the Bible quite often. I'm going to be using 1 Corinthians uh, 23 through 29 today when I talk about that. And I just want you to know that we practice here at Grace Journey Community Church, and you know, I never even checked with Pastor Nathan, but we don't, you don't have to be a member here. We do what we call open communion. Anybody who believes whether you're an actual member or not are welcome to participate in communion because we believe that that's the way Christ did it. You didn't have to be a member of a church or, you know, have to go through some kind of special deal. No, you just have to believe. And if you believe, we'd want you to participate. I want to first start off by reading 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 29, so that we get an understanding of exactly what the, what the communion is about and why it's so special. And it, Corinthians says this in 11, 23 through 29, For I have received from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then it's a warning. Whoever therefore eats of the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Man, you know, listen, this, this is very important. The Lord's Supper is very important, and it's a special memorial to what? Jesus' death. Again, for what? Our sins that we cannot reconcile without Jesus. He gave it all up for us. No more animal sacrifices. No more was needed other than to believe in him because he gave it all for us. It, this, this practice was what? It was instituted by Jesus himself. He asked his disciples to do this in memory of him. And he says, as often as you do it, we get all caught up. Should you do it weekly? Should you do it monthly? Should you do it quarterly? Should you do it semi-annually? Listen, it doesn't tell us. It says, as often as you do it, there is no right or wrong. It's just that we should do it. We should celebrate as often as we do. And when we do, we need to take it seriously. I think there's a danger if you do it every week, personally, because maybe you'll kind of not see how important it is. But it doesn't tell us. If it was really important, Jesus would have said, I want you to do this every time you meet. So remember that if somebody tells you, oh, well, you know, you don't do it right. You don't do it every week. No, that's not what the scripture says. As Christians today, it's very important that we come together for this very purpose of fellowship, for prayer and time to rejoice for what Jesus told us, it, what he did. And remember, it starts out with what? What he did on the night he was portrayed. He was portrayed, that he was betrayed by, by Judas. It should be a constant reminder for us the great sacrifices that Jesus paid for our sin. Because right after this, what happens to him? He gave it all. He gave it all for us. And we didn't deserve a bit of it. It's also a communion or sharing of the body and the blood of the Lord. So we're sharing it together, remembering together what he did for us, how much he loved us. It's not something to be trife about. It's not something just to do because we're supposed to do it. I pray today that you would feel the communion, feel what he was going through. Be there as I often do when I, when I preach. I try to remember, remind people when they listen to sermons to remember what it was like over 2,000 years ago so that you have a proper perspective on what was happening as they were in the upper room together. And he was, he was betrayed and he knew what was going to happen to him that he was going to be a sacrificed for our sin. And here he is with his, his disciples doing something that was very important. And today we are doing that same thing. 
It's also a time for what? It's a time for self-examination, as I read starting in verse 27. It's a time for us, if we're holding ill will towards anyone or anything, we need to let it go. We need to give it to the Lord. That's what this time is for. That's what the warning is for. You know, you don't have to also, you don't have to take communion every time. If you are not right, if you have ill will, if you need to go to a brother or sister in Christ and say, forgive me, I'm, I'm holding ill will towards you, then do that. If you just need to pray about it and let it go and give it to God before you take communion, that's good too. We need to make sure that we are ready to receive the communion. So use this time to repent and reconcile and then you can partake again the next time if you don't want to do it today. And I say, let no person judge you for not taking communion today because the Lord doesn't. The Lord knows that you may need that time that you will be ready next time to take communion. Paul said, if we judge ourselves, we shall not fall under God's judgment for this sin of taking the communion in an unworthy manner. I'd like to uh, stop right here for a moment, and I'd like to pass out the elements. So those that are going to be doing that, if you all would come forward, and everything is on this front seat. Jim, yours is a small basket. Jim's going to be uh, Jim's going to be given our deacon will be given communion to the uh, the people in the back, and we're just going to pass the backs the baskets back and forth. We'll have one person on one end and another person in the middle. So you'll just pass it down and then pass it back and we'll just uh, hand out communion that way. Yes. Um, right after the song, we'll have a time of silence and prayer. So right now, I just want everybody just to stay seated and they're going to sing while we pass out the communion. Anybody uh, that, uh, I, I was told there might be one or two people here that need, uh, what is it, uh, gluten-free. Gluten-free, there, there is one place, one little thing there that we have gluten-free for you. So just ask one of, the, one of the guys passing it out and they'll take care of you. In Christ alone, my hope is found.
do right now is is we're going to pray together and I uh, what I do during this time is I'm going to give us a time I'll pray and then we're going to go through a time of silence Thank you. and uh, that just means we're we're just going to all be I want you all just to concentrate on some of the things that I told you about just to pray to the Lord be thankful for what he did if you need to reconcile with yourself with anybody else take this time this little bit of silence of time to think about those things and concentrate on those things or concentrate on the glory of Jesus Christ for all that he's done for us. And that's what we're celebrating here today. Let's pray. Lord, Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you that, Lord, as you were in the garden and you were praying, Lord, and you said these words, you said, Lord, if there's any other way for this cup to pass, which was requesting, Lord, that maybe you shouldn't do it. But Lord, the next words define who you are and what it meant for us. When you say, but not my will, thy will. That you were going to be obedient to God. That you had a mission to accomplish. And Lord, that's what's important that you fulfilled the mission of which you were sent. And Lord, we sit here today and we remember. Lord, as we now go into a time of silence, Lord, I pray that you would just, Lord, help us to really concentrate and remember you and to forgive others. to be united as one. Lord, let us begin our time of silence. Lord, as we get ready, some might be saying right now, that wasn't enough time. And others were saying, what took you so long? But Lord, that's good on both parts. Lord, if, if you, um, Lord, need more time, Lord, I pray that you will make time uh, as you leave here today. And you tell us in your word to pray continuously. Uh, Lord, you don't have to stop. And Lord, we can't spend enough time on, on our bent knee, uh, Lord, in the presence of you. So, Father, I pray that we would all come together today to rejoice and to be thankful together. 
Amen. So what does it say in the scripture? Starting in verse 23, it says, For I have received from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took that bread. So if everybody would take their bread and open it up. So he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take. Try and do, try and do this without spilling it for me. Then it says this. He then he says, "Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me." Jesus, take. And for as often as you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And don't forget, it's either before he comes again, or we go home. Either way, it's amen. Uh, all right, let me uh, just do one thing. I want to pray right now. Uh, I want to pray for the uh, lunch that we're going to have. That's going to be over in the Life Center. So if when you leave these doors, you just go out, straight out, and then to the left, there's double doors there. That'll be uh, open. You go all the way into the gym. And, uh, you know, so you'll be able to see Some of you haven't seen the gym. You'll, you'll see it today, although it's going to have a bunch of tables all over it. But... <laughs> But that's where we're going to be rejoicing and e eating together. So that's where you'll go. So I want to bless the meal before we, we go start running around and everything. It'll be a lot easier to do right now. So let's pray for the blessing of the, of the food. Lord Father, I just thank you and praise you, Lord, for each and every one that's here. Lord, I pray that we have enough food to go around. I believe we do. Uh, Lord, I want to thank you for the hands that have prepped this. I, uh, you know, the ladies that are there all day right now and part of last night to prepare all this for everybody so I want to ask that you bless them for all that they've done uh, to pre help prepare for this and Lord I ask that each and every one that we would have a wonderful wonderful time of fellowship that we've already had this morning with the cafe and just meeting everybody that's been here today uh, Lord as I said you have poured that bucket of water over me as Pastor Nathan has talked about uh, Lord as you began the service as, uh, Lord I just felt that that spirit running through me. And Lord, I pray each and every one here is feeling the same thing, that Lord, you're at work here, that you would bless this time, that you would bless this meal. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, what we always do here at, at Grace Journey Community Church is we do a benediction at the end. I would like to ask Pastor Roberto to come up. He is gonna do our uh, benediction and it'll be on the board it's uh, it's Ephesians 3 20 and 21 and what we like to do here is everybody say it together this is not the pastor just reading it himself it's all of us reading it together so that we you know as we end with an amen which is very important amen. before I read the Bible I want to share something uh, that when Pastor Nathan preaching, I taking some note over here, and I want to share with you. Uh, I can see a little picture from the heaven from here. When I saw this congregation, I can see the the preview congregation in the heaven. When everybody coming together as a one nation, or as a one congregation, like from different nation, language, culture, different uh, skin color, all together worship the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this, if we want to live in something like this, maybe we can start living the heaven today from this side of the glory. Amen? Okay, I want to read in, in, in Spanish, and you can follow me or join me in reading in English, all together at the same time as Pastor Bill say. Okay? Y aquel que es poderoso 
para hacer todas las cosas mucho más abundante de lo que pedimos o entendemos, según el poder que actúa en nosotros. A Él sea la gloria en la iglesia en Cristo Jesús por todas las edades, por los siglos de los siglos. Amén. Amén. You're going to have to endure one more uh, grace journey uh, thing, and that is, I'd like you all to say, let's say amen together. Ready? Amen. Love you all. Glad to see you here today. Hope to see you over enjoying fellowship and eating together.